Welcome to another episode of Culinary School Stories, the weekly podcast that is dedicated to sharing the stories of people around the globe whose lives have been influenced, impacted, touched, and or enriched, for good or for bad, from their culinary school experience. Hi, my name is Colin Roach and I'm your host. Thanks for joining us today. You are an important part of this show where we ask the question, what's your culinary school story? So now, without any further delay, let's meet today's guest. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Culinary School Stories podcast, a proud member of the Food Media Network. If this is your first time joining us today, thanks for being here. We appreciate you listening in, and we hope you become a longtime listener and subscriber to the podcast because it is free. We would love to have you as part of our community. You can subscribe through your favorite podcast app, such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and a whole lot more, or through our website at www.culinaryschoolstories.com, which is also where we share all of the podcast's past episodes, as well as our guest bios and contact information. So be sure to check it out at www.culinaryschoolstories.com. So now, without any further delay, I would like to introduce today's guest who has a great story to share with all of us. Having grown up in a restaurant family, he grew up working in the business. However, after high school, he didn't do the traditional culinary school route. Instead, for his education, he traveled to Germany where he completed his culinary apprenticeship. And after working in numerous restaurants and hotels, including owning and operating a few of his own, he transitioned to a culinary educator, became an instructor at a number of different schools, which we're going to talk about. With that said, it is my pleasure to welcome Chef Rudy Klobel to the show. Rudy, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Chef. It's great to be here. Um, I've been a longtime listener. Um, I've listened to multiple podcasts of yours, and I'm always enthusiastic about, you know, hearing other people's stories and just their experiences with uh, culinary school and and hospitality in general. Yeah, that's what it's all about. We have so many similarities, you know, everybody going to schools, no matter where they are, or going apprentice route, you know, we're all very similar in the same way. And we like to get that message out, especially to those that are coming behind us. Yes. So I'm so excited to have you on the show. And I have to apologize in advance for my throat. I got a little bit of a cold, but I'm drinking my tea here, so I should be able to pull through. (laughs) Nice. So why don't we start out, what are some of your earliest memories of food and cooking? And when did you first realize that, you know, maybe this was going to be your career choice? Yeah, it's pretty interesting. So my dad was a chef and a butcher and um, he came over to the United States in the early 50s and started in the restaurant business and I was born into it. So right around two, three years old, my dad had branched off from working with his brother here in California and uh, opened up his own place in a little mountain village just outside of the San Diego County area. And so basically that's where my, my whole culinary experience started. He had a bakery and a restaurant. And so, you know, as a little kid, I was in the kitchen stuffing donuts <laughs> and, and, you know, doing all the little odds and end chores and, you know, getting involved in kitchens and and just watching the restaurant, uh, you know, evolve, the restaurant business evolve around me. And by the time I got into high school, that's where I was making my pocket money. So I would work for my dad, you know, working in the kitchen or in the front of the house. He had me wait tables and bus tables as well. And uh, did that all through high school, was trying to figure out what I was doing with my life. So I did a semester of community college and looked into the archaeology and wow that uh was something that i you know have a great interest in art you know history and archaeology in general mm-hmm. but uh i couldn't see myself making a career out of it so mm-hmm. at that very point my uncle and my dad they kind of got together and they said hey you know maybe what you should do is is learn another language and go see your uncle in germany and just see if it works for you, spend six months over there. And so after that uh, semester of community college, I took off, went to go see my uncle. I was pretty young, I was only 19. So, you know, had a lot of, a lot of different things going on in my life, not really sure of what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And um, 
it took me six months to get into the hotel school that I signed up for. And so I volunteered here and there in a small, small town with a big hotel and basically bus tables there because I didn't have a work permit. And in September of 81 is when the hotel school started for me. Great. So you did your uncle have a restaurant over there? Was he in the business or no? Yes. So my, believe it or not, restaurant business has been in my family for generations. And my brother is the only one that hasn't stuck with that. So <laughs> it's interesting. So um, yeah, my uncle, my uncle came over. He's the one that pioneered coming to the States. And uh, he was, he was in San Diego in 1953. And three months after he got to San Diego, he had his first restaurant. Wow. Yeah, he's he's probably the one that I, you know, look up to in the sense of tenacity and and just the follow through and being successful and and learning the value of money and running a business. He did really, really well. So your path was kind of chosen, right? I mean, they already, you know, collaborated to get you to go over to Germany. They figured you're going to follow in the footsteps. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's good. So did you speak the language when you went over there and you were busting the tables or did you just learn as you went? Yes. So I got to, I got to visit Germany in 1974 when I was about 10. So I picked up a little bit of it then. And, you know, as a young kid, I was like 12. So as a young kid, you pick it up pretty fast. Mm -hmm. And so then when I went over when I was 19, it was, you know, I was pretty rough around the edges in the sense of speaking German and actually going to school because you had to write and all that stuff. But uh, it came pretty fast, mm -hmm. and um, I was I'm fluent in Spanish too. So, so the thing is, is I guess I have a little bit of a knack for languages. That's good. So, why don't you tell us a little bit about the apprentice program? It's probably changed, but what it was like when you went through it, because it's it's not a big thing here in, in the United States. You know, most yeah. people go to a traditional college, associate's degree, bachelor's exactly. degree. Though it is coming back, and all the American Culinary Federations you know, promotes it and things, and maybe it will, maybe it won't, but maybe explain to the listeners what it is you went through. I mean, did you go to classes? Did we only work in? Was it with one chef, multiple chefs? So um, the hotel school was pretty interesting because it was 10 months and it was just about a hotel. Then I transitioned into my actual apprenticeship and I got credit for my first year. So that was great. And for me as an American, I had to find a sponsor. So I needed a work permit and a visa, found someone that would sponsor me into the into the apprenticeship program. And then um, it was five days a week working. So you worked five days a week. And depending on what year of the apprenticeship that you were in, you were dealt more responsibilities. And, you know, just depending on how you showed up and your enthusiasm for the work and all that kind of stuff. And so you worked four days a week and one day a week you went to school and school was just like regular culinary school. So you had um, all different kinds of subjects, a little more intense than what you see here. We had to take I had to take French, German and English in in culinary school. Wow. I had to take ethics. I had to take all these little knickknack, you know, side things, but uh, also cooking classes, practical classes, labs, all that kind of stuff as well. How do they fit all that in though? Because if you're only going one day a week and it's about, a, is it a two-year apprenticeship, three year? I mean, how... it's, it's a, it's a three-year program. So three years you go year round to these classes? Or... Yes. So, yep. Okay. Yeah. You're a lot of subject matter, as you know, being a culinary yes. educator, how do you fit all that topics in there? But I guess a lot is pushed on you to do on your own, you know, homework exactly. wise and research type. Yeah. And, and, you know, the interesting thing is, too, is that it was all in dictation, believe it or not, when I was going, because 1981, they had no computers over there. Right. That's what taught me German. So I had to write, I had to take notes on everything that was discussed in class. And so by writing it down, it got me into German a lot, you know, quicker and faster. So talk about the cooking part. Now you learn that in the school you just mentioned. So maybe you learn like, I don't know, a cuisine or saute or stocks or something. Then do you have to go back on the job and practice those particular skills and get assessed on those skills? Yes. So the way it works is, is that the, the apprenticeship school that I went to was a state run school from, from Munich. And they basically have a, a sheet to work off of of all the topics that need to be taught within each year of your apprenticeship. So the first year you're supposed to take on stocks and sauces and the fundamentals and knife skills and all those things. 
that gets signed off by the executive chef at your work. Mm -hmm. And so he goes through that with you and you sign off on all the different topic, you know, subject matter that you are going through. And um, it was, it was pretty fast paced, Mm -hmm. but, but the one thing is, is that um, it was just really, a lot of it was based on your enthusiasm and your want to, to learn. So like the, the restaurant that I worked in had a fine dining restaurant. It also had a steakhouse and then it had a production kitchen. Mm. And so you got to work in all three of those different kitchens based upon your experience level. And a lot of the, you know, first year apprenticeship students were working in the production kitchen, making lots of big batch, you know, material. And then as you progress through the program, you got to go into the steakhouse. And then from the steakhouse, you progressed into the fine dining restaurant. And that's how it was for me. So great. Now, what if you don't pass? What if they don't sign off? Is it up to the chef then to retrain you and have you do it again? Or do you have to go back to that class? That school is responsible? How does that work? You know, that's interesting because I was I was afraid that, you know, with the language barrier and some of the things that I had to go through, but I, I passed. So I believe the way that they run it over there as well is that you do get a second second round to do things. And I'm not sure how that worked with the restaurant, but they but they are obligated as far as I know to get you through the program so that you get your certificate. Mm-hmm. And then you come out as a journey journeyman or was it the, the Exactly. go apprentice journeyman and then you kind of keep going through the ranks. Yeah, so once once you get the apprenticeship, you are basically a certified cook and then from there you go on to your journeymanship and you find other places to work in, other chefs to work for and, you know, Based on your experience, there is how how you progress through the ladder and get you know get to become a station chef or something like that. It was it was pretty interesting. So I yeah. I uh, I really loved Munich. Munich is a is a very sunny town compared to the rest of Germany. There's lots of sun there in the summertime, and it does get cold. And we're close to the Alps, but it's probably got the best weather weather of all of Germany. Mm-hmm. And so from there, how did they first, how do they take you being an American? How did they treat you? How did they take you to the, like, what yeah. are you doing here? Why are you in our country? Did, anything yep. like that? Exactly. They, you know, I, I did get a lot of, a lot of jokes thrown my way and, you know, ah, oh, you're just a burger flipper and, and things like that. And, and it was, it was fun to, you know, establish myself and show people that I was serious. And, um, and in the, you know, the thing is too, is like, you as well as I do, you know what it was like being a chef in the eighties and being a cook in the eighties. And yeah, it was rough. I mean, there's no civil rights over there. You, if you stepped out of line and you were doing something really nasty or you were wasting food or something like that, you know, they'd rough you up. <laughs> they didn't, they didn't put up with, uh, yeah. Yeah. With those types of things. Yeah. And it's, it's in a lot of listeners may not know because this was like, you know, pre-computer pre-food network pre you know if you chefs weren't you know the the all-star the rock stars they are today it was a totally different oh exactly career type of thing militaristic yeah well it's it's interesting too because i worked for a swiss company that was in germany establishing restaurants and they were they were basically international so the sous chef of the restaurant that i worked in he was um polynesian and it was really really interesting because talking about a language language barrier i spoke better german than he did right and he just he was the type you know very militant he didn't put up with anything and he could you know he would prefer to speak english to you than german and if you know if you got in his way or if he was if he was uh <laughs> angry about something yeah, it wasn't it wasn't fun. Yeah, yeah, it's different world back then. Oh yeah. Not a better sure. world, but a different world. Yeah. So then you got out, right? So then you you stayed over there, worked a little bit. And tell us some of those stories. I was reading your bio, some of the famous people you cooked for and some of the stories. Share some of those with us. Yes. So I got out of the apprenticeship and I had realized that, you know, for me, basically, if if I wanted to do something and be successful and and live up to my uncle's standards that I would really, really have to put some time in. And so I decided to stay. I loved it. I loved it over there. I loved working over there. And I found a catering business that was pretty famous in the town of Munich, but I didn't realize they were pretty famous in Europe. 
They had 600 employees. It was one of the largest uh, catering businesses that I'd ever seen. And at first they wouldn't let me in. They said, yeah, you know, we're all filled up. We, we don't have any room for you. And interestingly enough, when I applied, I got out of, I got out of my apprenticeship in, in June. And then um, in September is when they're starting to look for people for the Oktoberfest. And it's, it's a big, big deal over there to work at the Oktoberfest. So they said, hey, you know what? Um, we do have something open for you. <laughs> if you'd like to work the Oktoberfest, we can possibly get you started there. And then we can see what, what happens. And so I did really well in that 16 days of Oktoberfest. And it's kind of an interesting story because the executive chef for the, you know, for the tent that we actually had at the Oktoberfest, he didn't see me until about 12 days in, and it's only a 16 day event. And my first job was, believe it or not, it was doing nothing else but stuffing chickens and getting chicken stuffed for the rotisserie chicken. Cause that's a big thing over there. And I was 12 days in and he walked by me one day and he's like, who the heck are you? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, Rudy Clobel, you can see it on my jacket, you know, very, very humble. And he said, where have you been working? And I go in the chicken room and he's like, what? And I haven't seen you. You're hired. And he hired me on the spot. Wow. And so. What did he see? What did he see or how, how you were working or your speed or you just saw something in you? I guess that he just saw something in me and he, he just really liked uh, my demeanor and whatever impression I made on him was enough to get me into the catering kitchen. Great. And so then, believe it or not, it was this, this place was so big that we had 25 garbage chefs, wow. just garbage chefs. And that's where they put me. So they put me in the garbage kitchen and, you know, there was multiple things that happened like, uh, stuff my uncle was getting ready to sell all those restaurants here in San Diego and my dad unfortunately passed away at that time so mm. it was all these different things happening so it just allowed me to stay over there and and really work on getting some experience and I had a great chef in that catering business he let me come home you know for my dad's funeral and all that kind of stuff during that time but I had accumulated so much overtime in that time that it was amazing. I already basically had, uh, you know, four to six weeks off. And, and that's. Yeah. Cause Europe's a little, you better explain Europe's a little different than here where you get the two weeks per year. Yes. And you got to cobble your special weekends exactly. to get away. Tell us about the, how it works over there. Yeah. So the thing is, is that was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me as well. When you're working in Europe, you um, you get six weeks paid vacation. Yeah, and so that's why you see a lot of Europeans coming to the states, or you know, when you're traveling yourself, you see Europeans because they get a lot of vacation time. Mm. And so, the the one thing that became so beneficial for me is is not only was I working in this amazing catering business, but then I continued to work the Oktoberfest every single year from there, like five years after that. And so it was a huge chunk of money. Within that 16 day period that I earned, like I, I made almost $5,000 back in the 80s. Wow. In that time. And um, so I got to travel and I got to see Asia. I got to see the Caribbean. I got to see South America. And all of those things were, um, you know, great experiences above and beyond me just being in the catering business. And that's one of the things we should emphasize too, is because culinary arts and cooking and hospitality opens so many doors. You know, it makes your perspective of the world so different because you get to travel, you get to experience these things you never would in, in some other type of industries. Yeah. This, this catering business that I worked for, it was, it was privately owned. So there were two brothers and a mom and a son. And um, all the wives, and there were 600 employees. We had our own carpenters. We had our own people that set the tents. We had all the dishwashers. We had, believe it or not, we had a huge warehouse right by the Munich airport so that when things were flown in and out, mm. they would be close to the warehouse right. to get things back and forth. And you know, it was a, an amazing time. I got to work on a train. I got to work all over Germany and um, catered for many, many different people. My my 15 seconds of fame, I always say, is that uh, I got to work and cater for the King of Spain. Wow. 
Yeah. And uh, what was that event? Just a regular holiday party or something like that? He came, he came to Munich for something. I don't know if it was some, some form of, you know, some formal invite or something like that from the state, but he was, he was in Munich and there were 300 people invited. That was the first and only time that I ever saw bodyguards come into the kitchen and taste all the food to make sure that nothing was, yeah. you know, that everything was kosher. They wanted to make sure everything was good. And sure enough, you know, I had, I had no idea Germans, you know, going through culinary school, they don't emphasize the French cooking as much as they do like here in the States. So you, I didn't learn that much about Escoffier and, and all that stuff. The, I'm, I'm sure you know that through the Second World War, there's a little bit of rivalry there. So they they don't <laughs> speak that much about each other. And so I'm I'm just doing my job in the kitchen. And I look over my shoulder and I see these three pastry chefs walk into the kitchen and they start doing the pastries. And it was Gaston Lenotre. Wow. Doing the pastry for this. Yeah. And he did a, I'll never forget it. He just did these peeled grapes with the Savoyon and some ice cream and came in, flew in on a helicopter and flew right back out. Wow, just for the event. Just for the event. And it was downtown Munich too. Like it was unbelievable how they organized all that kind of stuff. Yeah, the things you see. I mean, uh, tell us about some other people. You had another famous people that you worked for and stuff. You know, I'm sure the the listeners would love to hear those stories and the the bodyguards and the caviar and all the the decadence. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, so, well, one interesting thing was is that – we did another event, and this was outside of the town of Munich, down close to the Alps, somewhere on a lake. And I wish I wish I would have kept the menu because that was what the way the catering business wrote the menu up is their their invite list, the guest list was on a napkin, oh. and it was a cloth napkin, and they had it actually printed out for the event. And I, for some reason, I never saved that particular one. But there were there were twenty six people invited to this event. And there were 110 bodyguards. Wow. And so basically we were cooking way more for the bodyguards than we were for the actual people. But they, I don't remember the whole menu. I just remember that 26 people ate nine kilos of caviar. Wow. <laughs> and and it was just probably the most decadent event I ever, ever worked for. Whoa. And, you know, you, you get to see those things and it's, and it's just, you, you're in the kitchen so, I mean, that's another thing too. This isn't the type of catering business that we see a lot of times now where things are brought in in hot boxes. Everything was set up in a kitchen. Like you actually had a kitchen at the event. So there was a kitchen tent. And so you were stuck in your kitchen. They brought in ovens. They brought in all the stoves, all the gas, all that kind of stuff. And you did your event. You did your plating in there. So we set up plating tables and all kinds of stuff. So it was like a regular you know, offsite kitchen. Right, right. And that's not something that you see that often these days. No, only on high end events. You don't see it at most. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Lower end. But uh, the interesting thing for me was is I I also did get to to run and operate two businesses over there. So one of them wasn't successful. It only lasted about six months, and it was a it was a concept that we tried and I didn't get along with the people. They didn't get along with me. We couldn't get the numbers right. Well, but then I, um, towards the end of my time in, in Germany, so just around, so from 87 to 93, I found a place that was on a lake down south of Munich, about 40 miles out of town. And, you know, interestingly enough, the way restaurants work over there is that after the Second World War, um, what happens is, is all the breweries took over all the restaurants because the restaurants didn't have money. And uh. so that created this huge brewery monopoly over there. And what ends up happening is you try and find a lease on a restaurant and you have to sign a lease with a brewery and serve their beer. And this restaurant, this restaurant that we had down South on this lake was independent of any brewery. So we were able to get any kind of beer that we wanted for the restaurant. And it was a farmhouse restaurant and a destination. So it was right on the lake. And I stayed there for five years and cooked and ran the kitchen there. And um, became part owner. And it was just a great experience for me. Great. Yeah. And at that time is when my uncle, he had already gone into retirement, had already done, you know, a lot of exciting things. And he was getting serious about starting another business, believe it or not. Oh. And so he called me back to California. 
and he said, Hey, come on back. I've got this beautiful piece of property in California. We're going to, we're going to start a bed and breakfast. I want you to run it for me and, um, you know, come home. And so I did. And so I came back to San Diego in 1993 and we were on the outskirts of San Diego up in the mountains again on this beautiful ranch and, uh, tried to get a bed and breakfast going, but there was just a lot of red tape. Believe it or not, San Diego has more Indian reservations than any other county in all the United States. Wow, didn't know that. Yeah. And so one of the interesting things is, is that, you know, there's a lot of politics and stuff like that, and they just were not interested in in helping us. And part of, you know, part of the licensing for that type of operation is where they do well drawdown tests and things like that. And they will do these drawdown tests on other people's property, but they need to participate. And we were surrounded by Indian reservations, so none of them wanted to participate. So we uh, yeah. couldn't get the licensing. So your home, what'd you do next? Yeah. Well, you know, interestingly enough, that was probably one of the one of the greatest experiences I ever had because it was a, you know, my uncle was, like I said, he was successful. So he had 180 acres out there. And he just returned to his roots. And for him, you know, celebrating his pastime and all the things that he had done in life. He bought a bunch of cattle. He had a huge garden. We had an orchard. We had goats. We had chickens. We had pheasants. We had all kinds of farm animals. So that was another way of me being integrated into an aspect of culinary that I had never done before. So we we did a lot of our own, um, you know, slaughtering. Um, we did a lot of our own gardening, all that kind of stuff. And then in addition to that, he, you know, since he was successful and he was just one of those types of people that loved to entertain. So we were always entertaining for, you know, somewhere between 50 and 200 people all the time. Wow. So you became a farmer. Yeah. 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 So I spent, I spent five years on, on this ranch. And the thing was, is that, you know, we were really focused on getting this business going so that we could do something because it was way out in the middle of nowhere and there had to be some source of income. But, you know, we weren't a big enough operation to make money off the animals. And it was, believe it or not, this is also something that's pretty interesting. It's right before all the organic and, and farmer's market crazes that we had go through. So I couldn't find anything that was going to make me enough money. Mm. And so then I started looking for another job and, and I had been in the restaurant business. So I was looking around and I found a little tiny cafe in San Diego and uh, I was able to get it at a decent price. And I took over a cafe in, in San Diego and ran that for three and a half years. Awesome. So now take us to teaching. So now you're teaching and where did that happen? At some point you said, I'm going to go and give back to others. I want to get yeah. into the you know, education. I want to get into academia. Exactly. How did that happen? And, and tell us a little bit of that story. Yeah. So with me coming back to San Diego, I was also married and we were having kids and, you know, there was a lot of stuff going on both of us working really hard at our careers. My wife at that time, she was doing something completely different. She was a chiropractor and we tried to come up with a plan of, of making things come together. So the cafe was very busy. I was down there all the time, you know, working seven days a week, not being home much. And so what transitioned me into teaching was, is that she wanted to start a, a wellness program with her office. And part of that was teaching cooking classes and just basic basic cooking classes in the sense of getting people back into their own kitchens and you know doing 30 minute meals and teaching them about high quality oils and focusing a little bit on diet you know I never became a, a dietitian or a nutritionist or anything like that but you know getting people back to the basics and teaching them fundamental skills sure. and so that's that's what got me into um, teaching so I was doing that on the side um, I was doing that a couple of days a week in her office and I eventually sold the cafe and decided to work with her full time. And then uh, 2007, I got a job teaching at the Art Institute in San Diego. And that was my first professional teaching job. And um, very interesting. The school was packed. We had close to 700 students at the time. They loved my resume. They loved my initial you know, my little, my initial interview, working interview, and um, they needed, they needed teachers. And so they brought me right in. Oh, great. Yeah. And so 
interestingly enough, what also happened is, is, you know, they had standards and um, none of my education in Europe was being translated in a way that was being accepted here. Mm. So one of the obligations that they set for me was, is that I needed to get my bachelor's degree. And so I started teaching at the end of 2007, um, got my bachelor's degree and was doing that, you know, part-time while I was teaching full-time. And then um, I stayed at the Art Institute in San Diego from 2007 until 2019. Right, there a long time. Yes. Yeah. I want to take a quick pause here at this halfway point in the show and ask, are you currently in college or thinking about enrolling in college? Or maybe you're a parent, grandparent, or mentor of a high school or college-bound student. In either case, I want to share a super valuable free resource with you, and that is the nonprofit organization called Affordable College Prep. They are a free nonprofit organization that offers remote college support services for students and families, which means that they can help you with your college essays, the application process, finding financial aid, and much, much more. And again, it's free. So what do you have to lose? Check them out today. Their website is www.affordablecollegeprep.com. That's all one word, www.affordablecollegeprep.com. You can also find them on Facebook and Instagram at Affordable College Prep. Remember, you don't have to navigate the college admissions process by yourself. Affordable College Prep has been helping and educating students and their families on all things college for years, with an emphasis on saving money and doing what is necessary to get students to graduate in a timely manner. The Affordable College Prep advisors do an excellent job in helping students find and apply to the universities that provide the best fit academically, socially, and financially for them and their families. And they do this by providing remote support over the phone, as well as through video chat, email, and text messages to help you prepare for college. So be sure to take advantage of this free resource and contact them today. Okay, now back to the show. Let's talk about comparison now. So now you went through the apprentice program and now you're teaching in a, you know, what we call a traditional, I guess now these days at the Art Institute, an associate's degree or bachelor's degree program for students. What is the similarities, pros, cons? Can you talk about that? Are they, are they similar? Is one more preferred in your point of view? Yeah, so I I would say that the curriculum between culinary school and the apprenticeship program is definitely very similar. One of the things that I think is possibly, you know, an advantage from an apprenticeship program is that you get lots and lots of on on the job training. So you're you're constantly working in a restaurant and you're already, you know, hands in all the time doing something towards, you know, satisfying a guest. When it comes to culinary school, you're working off of recipes and you have timelines and, you know, demands from the instructors and and things that need to get done. But uh, it's a little different. You know, most culinary schools also have restaurants where you get to do some form of restaurant cooking. The Art Institute in San Diego had a restaurant where the, the students would go through just before they graduated. Mm-hmm. And that was, that was really nice because it was student run, student ideas, student menu, all backed by the instructor and the approval of directors and things like that. And uh, I enjoyed it. But I, I feel that you would possibly have a little bit more hands-on training through an apprenticeship program. You should get more of that practical experience in the restaurant. Exactly. But what if you didn't want to go into a restaurant? Because the apprentice program kind of you know channels you right into that. But what if someone went to culinary school and wanted to be like a personal chef or a private chef or wanted to work on yachts? Or yeah. You know, today, there's so many avenues that we didn't have back in the 80s. Back then, you went into a hotel, you went into an institution, you went into restaurants. Right. But now, there's so many options. Maybe you think culinary school would give them a better option. Yes. You know, maybe food photography, blogging, media. Exactly. Than you would with the apprentice program because that is so narrow. Mm -hmm. Well, so another thing that's really interesting too is that, you know, culinary school, especially here in the United States, there's a there's a big focus on understanding more and more about pastry. And and being a well-rounded chef here in the States requires that you have, you know, some 
pastry experience as well, a little bit. And that was something that I didn't get. So, you know, when you went to an apprenticeship program in Germany, it was like, you're going for becoming a cook, not a baker, not a confectionist, not a pastry chef. Mm -hmm. And so those were all different branches that had their own, you know, avenues of, of teaching. And the one thing that I would say for sure, especially what you just said earlier is, you know, going to culinary school here in the United States, you have that network of being able to look at so many different aspects. You know, is it really for me going into a restaurant kitchen, working a line somewhere, or is it, is it, do I have the possibility of becoming a personal chef or running a food truck or doing food photography and any culinary school, the culinary schools that I've seen are great platforms for that because you're working with so many different people and you get to know different aspects of it. You can network and, and find an avenue that would be really good for you. Like one of the things that the Art Institute was famous for is that they weren't just a culinary school. They had a big emphasis on culinary school, but they had a fashion program and they had an interior design program. And so the culinary students would collaborate with those different facets and make a restaurant. And so they would design chef's jackets and they would design what the interior of the restaurant looked like. And, and all of those things that are little extras that you got from, you know, a culinary school. And the one thing that I saw happen is, is I saw people connecting that normally wouldn't have had that opportunity to connect. And quite a few of them did things with each other afterwards. You know, they, they started something or they went to work somewhere together or, you know, things like that. Creating those relationships is super important. I mean, I still have connections to three or four people that I worked with in, in Germany. And we're always talking recipes. We're always talking about the times we had in school and, and, and those types of things. It's, mm -hmm. it's a great opportunity. Yeah, the networking, the open the doors, you, know, you might not get that in, you know, with the path of apprentice because you know, they have a yes. direct goal that they are going to, you're going to be a cook, or you're going to be this. Exactly. So you don't have that outside stuff, whereas culinary school seems to have more opportunities, sometimes to a fault because they don't really know what they want to do. It's like you got to pick a career, but there's so many opportunities like college in general, where you could take a lot of elective courses and, you know, do some exploring to find out you know, where your interests really lie. Exactly. And then the other thing is, too, is I can say, I mean, of course, this is, you know, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, too, is it was it was way more focused on, you know, this is your career path. You're going to be a cook. This is it. There's not much room for this whole creativity thing. And, you know, I think I think these days with the younger generations, you, you can't avoid the, the creativity. They are so creative, you know, coming into school already. And with, you know, all the different, you know, social media and, and things that we have these days, the food network and, and things like that help, you know, students mm -hmm. be so creative. And you should see I'm, I'm three weeks into my into my semester now with the restaurant class that I'm teaching in Greystone. And basically every single chef that I have working for me, chef, student chef, you know, they created their own plates. And their plating is phenomenal. We made some small adjustments and, you know, everyone's really happy. Yeah, the, the freedom to create and be, you know, customize how you want to prepare and how you look at food has definitely changed because before it was very strict. This is the way it is. It was, as you mentioned, German food or French food and you followed this prescribed to the T. But now, you know, there's fusion, there's so many opportunities to blend things, to be creative, to go yeah. and get inspiration on the internet or the social media and you bring that in. Exactly. With your own style. And I think I think that Europe is also transitioning a lot too. Like in the in the past couple of years, I've had a couple of students make it to Europe and actually get into, you know, a restaurant somewhere where they were they had an opportunity to do a really good stage for a couple of months or something like that. And, you know, that has all changed and and they're really moving up in the sense of promoting all the same things that we see here in culinary schools in the States. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you, do you think culinary school's worth it? Is the return on investment there? And do you need culinary school? I mean, what are your thoughts about that? Having gone through The Apprentice, having taught at multiple culinary schools, what do you think about the big picture and where it's going in the future? Yeah. Well, you know, I think I think that that's really interesting as well. I'm I'm sure that there are going to be lots and lots of changes in the sense of you see more culinary schools going directly on the internet without having brick and mortar campuses like Escoffier and uh, Ruby. I think is another one that I know of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
but um, you know, I think I think culinary school is something that is more directed towards those students that maybe need that structure. You know, you could probably do really well in the sense of working with someone that is a good mentor and working your way up the ladder and those types of things. If you have the right person in front of you, that's going to teach you everything that they know, which is never a guarantee. But the one thing is, and you know, in that sense, in that path, you're going to save money right? Because you're not going to have expenses for culinary school and those types of things. But I also see that there are many students out there that need that structure. Mm-hmm. You know, they need the structure of of having time to go over recipes more versus having to do it in a working kitchen where it's crowded and there's lots of stress and all those types of things. And then once they once they get that that basic experience underneath them, then they're ready for, you know, transitioning into a restaurant and things like that. And so, yeah, there is debt involved with college and it's not fun. But the one thing is, is I think you and I can both attest to the fact that, you know, culinary school is what you make of it. Mm-hmm. You have to go in with a certain sense of enthusiasm and and have that thirst for knowledge and and really, you know, make sure that you're getting the most for your money. Yeah, I agree. I think you know, culinary school is obviously not for everybody and you have to really do the soul searching and your due diligence and do your research and find out the options that you have and be serious about it. And it is going to probably have some debt, but I think it's really good, especially for students that have no experience. If you haven't grown up in restaurants or even worked in a restaurant, which you definitely should before you go best in culinary school. But I think that really helps because it does give the structure. It does give the foundation and the basics and people Many people don't have the discipline to do online. You know, online, you have to be disciplined. You have to be, you know, you're monitoring and motivating yourself yeah. to be able to complete those things. And some students don't have that. They need to go to school where they have that chef yes. instructor telling them, this is due, this is what you need, there's the deadlines, keeps them on the path. For sure. So what is, is culinary school that you see now? Is anything surprising you? Like, wow, they don't have this class anymore? Or, oh, wow, they have these classes now? Or, you know, thinking about the curriculum as a whole and what you're trying to set for outcomes and objectives for the students. You know, I know you're at the Culinary Institute of America now and you were at Art Institute in the past. Yes. Do you see any changes? Does it excite you? Does it like well, will it bother you? Tell us a little bit about what you see with based on your experience. So. I did transition from the Art Institute to the CIA and definitely, you know, the CIA has a a long time heritage in in school and teaching. And so their their program is amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there could be, you know, a little more transition in the sense of, you know, where where is it that we can go? Maybe a little more emphasis on some food science or maybe that whole creative aspect of, of offering, you know, like a photo class program in that sense. Um, I know I've been listening to your podcast and I, I hear that that uh, Johnson and Wales seems to be really focusing on, you know, what is necessary for this, for the future. And they've, they've adapted their, their program seems like a little bit more. Yeah. They, they did away with the college of culinary arts. Now it's called the college of food innovation and technology. So they've really started even positioning the colleges to the future and change. And it's not, you know, just so defined as it once was. Yes. Yeah. And I think, I think that uh, the CIA is going in that direction as well. But um, I think one of the things that's really important for students to focus on, if they're, if they're considering going to culinary school, they should be definitely working with the financial people and getting all the different types of scholarships that are available. I feel that that is not taken advantage of. And a lot of students leave school with a big number of debt, you know, big amount of debt. Mm-hmm. And they could have done better had they you know, really looked into what it takes to get some of these $5,000, $10,000 scholarships because they're available. We just had one go through the school up in Greystone that it was just, it was cooking a piece of fish. They were advertising a certain type of fish and you created a recipe around this fish and it was a $5,000 scholarship available, Mm. you know? And yeah, that requires work and it requires tenacity and staying late and finding a kitchen that you can practice in if you don't have one at home or something like that. But, you know, I, I truly believe that 
that's one thing that students should take more advantage of yeah. when they're going through school. I think there, yeah, you got a good point there, and as to look into all the opportunities for funding, because there's so much out there. You can get employer paid. I mean, a lot of employers, Chipotle, a few of them, are paying for culinary school for their workers now. You know, so they're doing that as a benefit. You can also maybe start at a community college, you know, mm-hmm. do two years there, and then transfer for the four years. I know a lot of people do that when they go to Cornell and other places along that line. Right. And there's programs at many schools. I know Johnson Wales has it, which is called like garnishing your degree, where if you already have a bachelor's degree, you only have to go in and take one year of the lab classes. You don't have to take the whole thing. That saves, you know, 50% right there off your total tuition. So explore, look around. There's a lot of websites out there that can help and find that, you know, those sources of revenue that can reduce your overall debt. Exactly. Get that general education possibly out of the way before you go into culinary school and, you know, do that through a community college and make sure that the school that you're applying for will accept those credits and then finish off for sure. Yeah. And I think you mentioned too, the photography and these other types of courses that, you know, the going into the culinary school, you don't have to have your life planned out 100%, but know that there's so many opportunities and and take advantage of those while you're in school and see if that may be something you want, like food photography or blogging, or maybe even teaching, you know, find those electives, find those instructors that you can, you know, as a mentor and ask questions about it, Mm because it's not defined. You don't have to like when we went, it was a cook, a baker, a hotel manager, right? Now it's so wide open and you can change as you go through and, and to really take advantage of that time when you are on campus. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, that's that's one thing I think that is also important too is, you know, I'm sure that it's the same in your school. We we have office hours and it's unfortunate that the students don't take advantage of that because that's a time where you can really, you know, pick a particular chef that you connect with, pick their pick their brain and and find out, you know, what it is that they could do to possibly help you or mentor you or, you know, just talk about life and and find out what it is that, you know, makes you smile and get up in the morning, you know? Right. Yeah. And take advantage of all those um, events that are on campus too, you know, because they'll need volunteers, volunteer for everything. You're in there. Now it's outside the curriculum. You're one-on-one with those chef instructors or those guest chefs in there. You get to work with them, opens up doors for networking, for job opportunities, to just learning new skills that are outside the curriculum and don't have time for it. I know uh, I'm doing some adjuncting now for Florida International University and they have the big South Beach food and wine every year, you know, in February, it's coming up. What an opportunity for students to go and get involved with the network stars and, you know, help out and see some of these celebrity chefs and just get involved in a huge, huge event. And I know CIA has those and other schools do and take advantage of those. That's all extra that you don't even have to pay for. Yeah. So we're, we're lucky up in, in Napa where we're at, you know, because the thing is, is it's wine country. And so there's lots of good restaurants and, and lots of opportunities for students to not have to travel far for their externship or things like that. And then we have the, we have Copia, which is our adjunct, you know, campus. And there's lots of events that take place there Mm. where, you know, it's an international thing. Chefs come from all over the world to take part in these events. And, um, that's the opportunity. It's networking, you know? Yeah. So you have done quite a few things. You know, you have that apprenticeship. Now you're teaching school. There's a lot of information that you still have that we're not going to be able to get to. But if somebody had a specific shout to you, is there a way they can contact you or the way they can follow you, see what you're doing in your career? Sure. My Instagram handle is basically just my name. So it's Rudy Global. And um, you will see Bryce's butter on there. That is um, something it's named after my son. Uh, for a while, in, during that time I was working at a cafe, I sold compound butters. But uh, also my email is just rudy.global at culinary.edu. And they can reach me through email or Instagram. And um, those are my two handles. Great. I'll put those in the show notes in, the, in your bio. So if okay. anyone is listening and doesn't have that, they can have, get those links that way if they do want to get more information on you. For sure. So you've been a teacher and instructor. From your point of view, as a student, as an instructor, as a teacher, what makes a good teacher? What makes a teacher effective? Yeah, I think think one of the things that makes a teacher effective is clarity. And um, I think that that's one thing that I would say I have as an attribute. And it's, and it's just 
making sure that you take the time to communicate well enough so that the person that is giving instruction understands what you're saying. And, you know, I've worked with a lot of chefs and some of them have horrible accents and some of them, you know, they speak very unclear. And then all of a sudden you have COVID and you're wearing a mask and you can't, you know, you, you, mm. you can't understand things correctly. And I think if, if people have good direction, and they understand where that direction is, then it just makes things flow. So it's it's about organization. It's about clarity. Those are things that I think are really important for instructors to have. And having patience too. Patience is a big thing these days on both sides. You know, you have people that they want to learn something really fast that, that takes a while to learn in the sense of having repetition and those types of things. But at the same time, be patient with yourself and it'll come, you know, hand skills don't just come overnight. Mm -hmm. So looking back on your career, do you have any regrets of anything you wish you had done? Anything you would change if you had the opportunity to change it? Yes, I do. Um, in, in one sense, I think I should have taken more advantage of Europe. And, you know, you see all the all the cultures there that we have and, and we get to experience now through the Food Network and things. I should have spent some time in Spain. I should have definitely gone to Italy. It's it's so interesting. I, pasta, pasta making is probably one of my favorite things to do. And I didn't take advantage of that. And I had I had the work status and the visa to be able to do that. I um, after being there and doing my apprenticeship, I got a a visa that was a full time visa that I you know wouldn't have to reapply for and things like that. So I could have taken advantage of it, hmm. and I didn't. And so you know, because Europe has so much to offer. Each country has so much. You know, even even just looking at Portugal and seeing what Portugal has to offer. They have some of the oldest ports, you know, in all of Europe and their cuisines and their, their traditions and all these different things. So if you do get a chance to go to Europe, travel, travel and don't get stuck in one place. Yeah, that's good. Well, as we come to the end of our chat today, and before we wrap up, is there any last minute advice or guidance beyond what you've already told the listeners that you would like to share with them that you could, you know, leave them those little nuggets of knowledge? Yeah, well... You know, you and I both come from a completely different type of kitchen where there was a lot more dictatorship than it is these days. And I, I really hope to see that we can find kitchens that work well together. You know, that the whole sense of team is something that I think needs to be emphasized in kitchens. And, you know, when you have a team that works well together, it, it just makes it that much more fun to be in the kitchen because you're already working long hours and you're working holidays and you're working, you know, all the times that a lot of people get to spend at home because they're not working those holidays. And so if you can find ways to, you know, promote teamwork and responsibility and self-accountability, those types of things I think are important to emphasize for anyone that's going into kitchens these days. Yeah, so true. So true. Well, that is just about all the time we have for this episode. I want to first thank you, Rudy, for being on the show today and sharing your culinary school story with all of us. I really appreciate your time and your insight and the honesty that you shared with the listeners. Thank you so much, Colin. It was great to be here. It's so, so good to see you, you know, live like this. And because I've been listening to your podcasts and you have such a remarkable story and, you know, there's not many doctor chefs out there. So that's, that's amazing. And uh, great to have an opportunity to share my past. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, we thank you. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye now. All right. Bye-bye. And a big thanks and appreciation also goes out to all of you, the listeners. We hope you enjoy the show and this episode. You all are a big part of this show, so please let us know what you think. Your comments are always welcome, and they help us in making the best show possible. You can email them to culinaryschoolstories at gmail.com. That's culinaryschoolstories at gmail.com. Or even leave us a voicemail at area code 207-835-1275. That's area code 207-835-1275. And if you like the show, we have a big ask of all of you. And that is to share the podcast with everyone you know and to give us a positive rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Okay, until our next culinary school story, take care and be well. Bye-bye.
Culinary School Stories is a proud member of the Food Media Network.